Okay, welcome everybody. Those who just uh, joined us. Welcome. Kitza Shachanarach, the, uh, the abridged code of uh, Jewish law. And we're doing chapter 94. And we're up to number six. Number six. Okay, so in the middle of speaking about how to make an Eruv. So till now, till now, we've been speaking about which joined or potentially joined properties have to make an Eruv to carry or optionally can make, or if they don't make, what happens? Now we're speaking about actually making the Eruv. So when we mean making the Eruv, we don't mean making the structure. The structure is... Uh, separate. So we have a presumption before we even get to number six that there is a structure. So let's let's keep it simple. Let's say there's a townhouse complex and it's got a fence around it. But there's a common area and unless they formalize an Arif, they can't carry in the common areas. So what do you do to make this Arif that now we can um, carry? So, Vav number six. What's the best way to make an Eruv? So, one of the householders of this courtyard, so we'll call him Mr. A, and he takes a loaf of bread that belongs to him. And he gives a share of it through giving it to somebody else, Mr. B. And Mr. B acquires it on behalf of himself and every other resident of this courtyard or apartment building or townhouse complex or city. The Haino, what, how, how do they do that? He has to say to the other person in a language that he understands. Right? Now, we'll just um, go on a slight tangent here and we'll speak about, you know, davening or various things. So, normally, so nothing to do with an Arif now, just in general, majority of our davening, although ideally we should understand each word, but in practice, if we don't understand, we have fulfilled the obligation because the words themselves have the holiness. We understand generally that we're speaking to God, and therefore that is sufficient. Now, there are certain parts that you we need to understand the meaning for. An example, uh, the first two sentences in the Shema, but generally speaking, um, if you don't understand what you're saying, the words themselves fulfill the obligation. So Purim's coming up, and we're going to hear the Megillah. Now, even if a person does not understand one word, as long as he understands or she understands they're hearing the Megillah, and they hear it, um, they fulfill the obligation. There are certain things, though, that Saying is not the objective. So, for an example, counting the Omer. So, we won't get into it now. The sphere is the Omer counting sphere because it's uh, not today's topic. So, but the, there is a time of the year between Pesach and Shavuos, and we count the dates. Now, if you don't understand the words, then you didn't fulfill the obligation because the purpose is to count. Other things, the purpose is to say the words. Hopefully, you also understand. But saying the words fulfill the purpose. When the whole purpose is to count, and saying the words is just how you count, then if you don't understand it, you didn't count. Right? So if you meant to say in Hebrew that today is the sixth day of the Omer, because you need to count the six days, if you don't understand the Hebrew, well, then you didn't count. Because you can only count if you understand that you're counting. So certain things, if you don't understand the meaning so much, 
you should say it in English or whatever other language you understand. So another example that's coming up soon is on Pesach, we nullify any comets, any leaven that we still own. So um, if you don't understand it, well, you didn't nullify, you didn't, because the purpose isn't to say the words, the purpose is to make a verbal declaration of nullifying ownership. And if you don't um, understand what you're saying, then you didn't do that. In that case, you don't have to understand every word, right? If you know that this statement means I'm nullifying my ownership and you say it without understanding it, then that's also good. But at least you have to know what you're saying. So over here, when we make the Erev, we're conferring ownership through someone else. So Mr. A, let's just say there's 10 residents in this townhouse building. So Mr. A is taking a loaf of bread. He's going to give it to Mr. B. Mr. B is going to accept, the, accept a share. He's going to accept ownership on behalf of himself and all the other residents. So if he doesn't know what he's doing, he can't take ownership. Right? He has to actually understand. So that's why um, this statement, he has to understand what he's saying. So if he doesn't understand the Hebrew, he needs to say it in English or whatever other language um, he understands. So we give the loaf to him and we say the following. Take this loaf. And acquire ownership on behalf of all the Jews who live in this chotzer. The chotzer literally means a courtyard, but we're generally referring to um, the, uh, you know, the apartment building, the townhouse complex, literally a courtyard. Uh, various things. It says, come and take ownership on behalf of the person, of everyone who lives there. Now, then what happens? The person who takes the loaf, so Mr. B, he takes the loaf and he has to raise it one tefach. Now, again, a tefach is the size of a fist. So again, we're not threatening anyone, God forbid. It's just it's a measurement. So it's to lift it in the air that high. And that 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 that's an act of acquisition by lifting an object. Okay, in halacha, there are several acts of acquisition, several things you can you can do. And the best one is to lift it. Now, obviously, you can't lift real estate, you know, unless you're Samson or something, but uh so that's not how we acquire real estate. But most objects, the best way to acquire it is by lifting it. Susan. Does this have to be done every year or just one time? Um, that's an excellent question. Meaning what we're saying here, they probably did every week. Every week? Because they're taking a fresh loaf of bread. Oh. And, and after a week, you know, I guess another week, Okay. It's gonna, it's gonna uh, be decorated with mold and various okay. things, and okay. people probably won't want to eat it anymore. So, what when we you make do a challah for the Shabbos, then you bring a, the, uh, a third loaf, and that's what you do. Yeah, or whatever. So he's taking. So in this case, he's taking a loaf of bread, and we're gonna see how how much bread there has to be soon. Now, in our in our city, Ayrovin, what they normally do is take matzah, because matzah keeps. In the box wrapped in plastic, and they um, they renew it every year. That that's what's generally done. But in concept here, we're talking about uh, not a city area; it's a courtyard. You know, there's a uh, well, a smaller area. Yeah, right? ten of us, ten of us in this okay. uh, complex, and so they would do it every week. Nevertheless, you even for the complex, the small complex, you could do it once a year. It's no problem. Ezra, do you have a question? No, and I was going to say that uh, uh, Rabbi Lairfield, used to, uh, I guess it would be Erev Pesach, would renew the Erev yeah. every, uh, every year using a box of matzah. Yeah, that, that, that's the general practice for a city Erev today. So that's what they do. Unless, uh, 
something happens to the food in the interim. Right, so. Pesach, you have a fresh matzah. That's why it's a good time. Yeah, but also it's been there the whole year, but even though it is matzah, we're worried that perhaps it got uh, contaminated with something. Um, and even matzah doesn't keep forever. So, you know, they, they take new matzahs each year. They, they do that. But, um, but in concept, this person is taking a loaf of bread. So presumably this person would do, these people would do it weekly. And, and that was reasonably common in those times. So he, uh, he takes the loaf and the person has to lift it to make an act of acquisition on behalf of himself and the other residents. And then the person who's making the Erev takes it back from him. So Mr. A is taking back the loaf from Mr. B. And this loaf now belongs to all 10 residents. And he makes the following bracha. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaVoylam, Blessed you, Hashem, our God, our personal God, my King of the Universe, Shirk the Shom Bezoysov, that he makes us, gives us opportunity to make ourselves holy through doing mitzvahs. The Tzivano our mitzvahs Eiruf. And he commanded us about the mitzvah of making an Eiruf. Um, and then he says, with this Eiruf, it's permitted for us that, that now we can um, take out and bring in in a bottom from the house to the courtyard, meaning the common areas in a hot the bottom and from the courtyard back into the house, Mabias the bias from house to house. And this applies to all the residents of the houses of this courtyard. And if it was a um, city Arab, we would say, instead of saying the word courtyard, we'd say city. The Kivan Shikulam Zacho Bekikoze, since all of them have a share in this loaf. And when Shabbos enters, the loaf is being held in the house of the one who made the Erev, or wherever they decide to keep it. It's like now that everyone lives in this house. This loaf and, and the access to this loaf is made where it's stored their common kitchen. And it's like they all live in this house. We, we transformed this uh, townhouse complex or apartment or city into one large house or property. Therefore, we can carry from the courtyard, the common areas to the house, from the house to the courtyard, common areas, and from house to house. Okay, so just, just a few points. Number one, as we discussed, of course, this is a rabbinic mitzvah. Right? Because we, we said we make this type of Erev in the Carmelis, which is not a true public domain. It's, a, it's almost a public domain. It's missing one of the criteria, one or more. And, but, but because it's so similar, rabbinically we can't carry there, and rabbinically means from biblical times, um, pre-King David, we can't carry there. Because we're worried that people will find it too similar to the public area and they, they won't understand that it's going to lead to people carrying the public domain. So this concept of Eiruv was put together by King David and King Solomon. And they, they um, made this Eiruv. So it's a rabbinical command. And yet we see the bracha, we're blessing Hashem for giving us mitzvahs and for commanding us to make an Eiruv. And as a matter of fact, many rabbinical mitzvahs, lighting the menorah, as an example, <clears throat> we make the same bracha. I mean, also for biblical mitzvahs, like shaking love and esra, or sitting in the sukkah, but there are quite a few rabbinic mitzvahs where we make this blessing, and seemingly Hashem didn't command it, the rabbis commanded it. So uh, the reason that we make a blessing that Hashem commanded it is because Hashem gave the Sanhedrin, there's a mitzvah that the Sanhedrin can make rules like this and we need to follow it. 
So that's the commandment that Hashem made. Ben, yes. Yeah, I want to say uh, it says that he is giving him a kikar lechem, and then he takes it back and makes a bracha al matzot. No, al mitzvahs ayruf. Oh, mitzvah, I thought matzah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's without, without vowels, it is the same word. Okay. I mean, technically, yeah. Um, yeah. So it would have the same, uh, the same letters. Matzot and mitzvot, so yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, he has. So um, everyone has a share. So in a city, Ayruf, the way it generally works is that people pay some type of fee, right? And that fee goes to the the upkeep of the structure. Um, you know, they buy the matzah, which probably isn't that expensive, and also pay someone to ex inspect the. Um, and it's through paying the fee you get your ownership in in the food. That's generally how it goes. So uh, it's actually quite important for people who live in a city where there's a communal Arif to subscribe. You know, so I don't know what it is in other places, but in Phoenix here, it's, a, it's $100 a year. If you like, you can pay it off weekly. You know, so it's, uh, it's not, a, not, not a huge amount, but uh, with everyone contributing, it's enough to um, maintain the, uh, the Arif. It's not a profit organization. Okay. So two things we said so far. Number one is everyone has to have a share in the food, an ownership of the food. That's what makes our common kitchen that we all um, like live in the same house. And we spoke about how we, one person, so I don't have to, let's say I was making the Arif. And everyone here was uh, a member, we're all living in the same courtyard. I don't have to go to each person, say, pick up the bread and, and take uh, ownership of a share. I can just go to one person and they can acquire it on behalf of everyone else. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, do the other owners have to be in the room when you make... The Eruf Hatzerot. No, they don't. They don't have to be in the room. They um, they don't necessarily have to know about it. They have to agree that they want to be part of the Eruf. Okay. Well, they have to agree. That if someone doesn't does not want to be part of the Eruf, then that becomes problematic. It becomes problematic for everyone involved as well. But let's presume that they generally, you know. They said, I want to be part of it. But each week, I don't have to tell them. Because for someone's benefit, you can acquire something on behalf of someone else for their benefit. So I'll give an example. Um, let's say I found a suitcase loaded with cash in the street. And I pick it up and I say, I'm acquiring this on behalf of my intentions to pick it up for... Uh, Someone else, let's say, uh, for Ben, let's say. Don't get excited, Ben. It's just theoretical. Right? Didn't find the suitcase. But, you know, picked it up. Now, since it's to his benefit, even though he's not aware of it, doesn't know, I have acquired it for him. So I can't change my mind and keep it for myself. You know, it's, it's, it's as if he's already taken possession of it. However... Let's say um, I found something that is not to his benefit. So, uh, um, I don't know. Um, what be something, let's say uh, a bill. No, that's right. I think it's something. Anyway. A gun. You a gun? A gun? Well, well, you could say a gun is to his benefit because even he doesn't want it, he can sell it. It has monetary value. But a gun nice. might be a good example. If he's known to be someone that that does not want to have ownership of a gun, right? But otherwise, if I find something that's uh, so let's not say finding, let's say now um, 
someone wants me to uh, acquire a slave on behalf of Ben. So let's not talk about whether slavery is good or not. Let's leave that aside. But the problem is, even though there's benefits, the person have have the slave, he's got to feed him, he's got the health care, he's got, you know, it comes with all these responsibilities. And so maybe he doesn't want that. So that would be a example where I don't necessarily acquire on his behalf. Right? So like a box of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that only has benefits. That only has but benefits. I found once a suitcase. I used to work in the airport in Israel, and on the way to work, I found a, a suitcase, and I took it and dropped it off and uh, lost and found. Somebody was looking for it. Okay. <laughs> did you shake it for a lot of cash? No, no, no. I'm glad you did. I didn't meant to check that. what was in there. That's right. No, it's, uh, so... Um, since he wants to be part of the Arif and the Arif benefits him, because now we can carry to and from the shared areas, he can carry to and from um, people's houses. So unless he's expressed uh, that he does not want to be part of it, then we assume it's to his benefit. Right? It doesn't cost him anything, and it's to his benefit. And therefore, someone can acquire on his behalf without him knowing. Okay, number seven. Sarah Chazaka is Davka Ali Day Acha. Now, to give the share, this has to be through a third party. In other words, I can't take my loaf and say, I'm giving a share to someone else. Because for the share to become owned by someone else, there has to be an act of acquisition. Now, I can't do an act of acquisition because I already own it. So I can't do an act of, you know, if it was something that I bought and I'm buying it now and I'm buying it for me and everyone else, well, then maybe there's something to speak about. But I have this loaf and uh, I can't make an act of acquisition because I already own it. I can't have an imaginary act of, act, act of acquisition if no one's there. So I need a third party. So we need at least Mr. B to acquire it on behalf of everyone else. So since I can't do it through myself, we're going to see there's other people I can't do it through as well. And therefore, I cannot, the Mr. B cannot be my children under bar or bas mitzvah, even if I'm not currently supporting them, because their hand is like my hand. Right? So uh, I can't say to my eight year old son, here, you take it on behalf of everyone else, because if he would find a lost object, Allah belongs to me. Um, his hand is like my hand, so it doesn't work. Avol ayade cotton akar, but through another child. So let's say next door's um, under Barbas Mitzvah person, Yachul Azakris. I'm able, well, this person is able to make an acquisition on behalf of the rest of the residents. Now, normally we say that someone under Barbas Mitzvah cannot make an act of acquisition. They can't take ownership because we say, what does Barabbas Mitzvah mean? It means they have the intellectual, they're at a stage of intellectual development. They understand what they're doing. You know, and a five-year-old doesn't understand. So normally we say that they can't do an act of acquisition. So in the brackets, the Medei the Rabbonin, Koten For a rabbinical a decree, we're letting it, but, you know, it's, it's, in other words, it's, it's, the, the whole air of concept is, is rabbinic, so therefore we can be a little bit lenient. Now, again, just a side point to this. Um, I'm going to say in concept, now don't get excited because it's not the halacha. In concept, so let's say you have this uh, 12-year-old boy, so he's under bar, bar mitzvah, and he goes to the store and he buys something, $50. Right? He buys, uh, uh, I don't know, a little um, 
CD player if they still have them anymore, right? $50. Now, from a Torah perspective, he, can't, he cannot acquire it. So he never owns it. So in theory, from a Torah perspective, I could walk up and take it, make an act of acquisition, and it's mine I didn't steal. Now, obviously, you can see if this is what happens, God forbid the disasters are going to happen over here. So the sages, and again, in biblical times, allowed a miner to make a rabbinic um, acquisition, ability to acquire. So if he would go to the store and buy something, another person can't take it away. Right? And they made it out of Darchi Shalom. There should be peace in the world. Because, you, you know, you can just imagine. Imagine every adult had the ability to, God forbid, take advantage of children like that. And then the parents would come and try and, you know, punch him in the nose and take it back. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a disaster. So um, although in a society where everyone would behave appropriately, it's not an issue. But unfortunately, we, we live in a world where not everyone behaves as they should. So we, we give this minor the ability to acquire things, even though he, rabbinically, even though he doesn't have a, uh, a Torah ability to acquire things under Barabbas Nassim. Okay. Now the Im Efshan, if possible, so ideally, he shouldn't, the Mr. B should not be his own wife if he is financially supporting her. Because again, that's like an extension of himself. Or through his adult children, adult meaning over bar or bas mitzvah, but not yet living in their own household. And they, they live with, they're being supported by the father. They shouldn't, shouldn't have them be Mr. B either. Because there is an opinion uh, that they are also like his own hand. So if need be, so we can't mock him nevertheless, but there's no one else. It's five minutes for Shabbos, everyone else is in the shower. So, so what are you going to do? He's not going to be an Arab. We can use then the Mr. B can be the wife, his wife, or his post bar bar mitzvah children that he's still financially supporting. Now, the Im Habein Nasa Isha, if his son is married to a woman, in other words, he's married already, so he has his own household, or even if he's staying in your house, but, you know, he's independent to a certain extent. Even if the father still supports him, the Chuli Alma Yachlis Afis Al Yadoy. According to all opinions, he can still acquire on behalf of everyone else. All right, so just to summarize this, we need a third person, third party. We need a Mr. B to acquire ownership of the loaf from Mr. A on behalf of himself and everyone else. Uh, it has to be someone that is not an extension of Mr. A. So it can't be Mr. A's children if they're under Barabbas Mitzvah. Can't preferably not his post Barabbas Mitzvah children if he's supporting them, unmarried ones, and preferably not his wife if he is the one um, providing financial support. So um, we need a someone else. Okay. Right now, obviously, if we're acquiring the loaf on behalf of everyone. There needs to be enough food in the loaf for everyone to have. All right, so we need, or we're going to see when we have huge numbers, you know, make an air for a city, you don't have to have, you know, uh, 500 pounds. We're, we're, we're going to see what, but let's keep it simple to the courtyard first. So five households. So, you, you know, you can't have, um, you know, five grand, you know, five ounces or something. You know, you have to have enough that everyone can take something. So number eight, Ches. 
Kamahu shiha eruf. What is the shear? What's the measurement of the eruf? How much do you need to have? How much bread or food do you need to have? So we're going to have a few different measurements depending on how many people uh, are involved. So, Bizman Shem Shimona Asa Balibatim Opophis. When you have 18 or less households, 18 or less, Shirokogoigaris, the whole echod, you need the size of a dried fig per person or per household. Right, so only a small piece. We only need a small piece each. And that's as if it's 18 or less pieces. You've got two people, two households. A loaf only has to be the size of two dried figs, not very big. 18 people has to be the size of 18 dried figs. You know, probably smaller than a regular hollow, than a large hollow. Yes, Dobby. Yeah, it says in my copy of this Shulchan Aruch, in contemporary measure, the size of a dried fig corresponds to 19.2 cc's, cubic centimeters, according to Shirei Torah. Okay, very good, thank you. So not very big. You know, it's a relatively small piece. Ezra, yes. No, when it says you have a... a a kego get is that per meal or is that total for the entire uh, that's, Shabbat? That, that's per household for the Shabbos. Okay. So uh, you don't need you don't need a lot. Now that's condition number one. Chutz mize. So besides this, shoisis aedo menichal besuch meisur. Right, so the one who puts the Erev in his house, he doesn't have to put in food. So let's say there's five houses. Four people have to chip in the food. So that's to be the food for, for them. And now they didn't actually have to give because as we said, a person can give the loaf and have it acquired on behalf of everyone else. But in other words, so in, our, in the example of five households, the loaf has to be four the size of four um, dried figs. The person who's keeping it in his house does not need to have a share in the food. He who ain't a sarach let the time pass. He doesn't have to give bread. Why? Given shabola hachiyodashon, because he already lives in his house. Right? People are keeping their share of the bread in the house, making them residents in that house. Right, this is what we're doing. You know, this is we have a so to speak a shared kitchen. We've all got our share of food here. So, uh, so let's say it's in um, I know in David's house, the bread. So I have to own some of the bread in David's house, and that entitles me to be the I'm so to speak a resident of David's house, and I go there and I eat there or have the ability to eat there. But David already lives in his house, so he doesn't have to put in bread to become a resident in the house. Doesn't have to have ownership in it. So uh, he's separate. So that's if there's up to eight or eight, up, up to 18 inclusive, 18 people or less, they need uh, one dried fig size of bread per person. Susan. Okay, so what do you what do you do with all those pieces of bread? You can hand them to the different households? Well, um, here, here in- it's bread. So when, you actually, when they used to, in Talmudic times, they used to put bread each week, and people came and ate it. You know, when you have the matzah, normally they just leave it. If someone comes and eats it, we have to replace it. The Erev can only exist when the food exists. Now, we're going to see when. If it gets eaten on the Shabbos, we're going to see when it had to exist to. We'll, we'll get to that shortly. But um, but this is every week. You have to have... Well, if you did it, if you did a fresh bread every week, right. then you have to do it every week. If you did the matzah that lasts the year, then as long as no one actually eats it, as long as it's sitting there, there's no problem. 
So they so they, they don't they, have to eat it. So they have to have the rights to eat it. Okay, now I get it. Right. Yeah, sorry that I wasn't clear. So if it's an Arab in a city, in theory, it's not you, it's me. Believe me, I, I, I was. I'm thinking yeah. literally. It's not literally. It's you're figuratively having the food there. Yes. The, oh, now I get it. That they could come eat it. So in a in a city Arab, there's usually a shul or some communal building, and they've got the boxes of matzah there. So in theory, you have the right if you're a member of the Arab to walk in and eat the food. They might not be very happy with you, but 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 you could, and they you know they have to let you. Otherwise, it doesn't work. If not for the fact I'm worried that someone might not replace them, that won't be an aid of. So one of those things I like to do one day is a practical job, but I never will. You know, like goldfish in the mikvah on Purim. You know, it's, it's, won't won't actually do it. It's just one of those things. You know. But anyway, so. I like the story of the Grim Reaper costume better. <laughs> <laughs> I've let it out of the bag. Now, that's if there's up to 18 people. If you got more than 18 people. So let's say you have City Arif with a thousand people. You have to have like a loaf of bread that's got a thousand, you know, well, what do you do? So if it's more than 18, I feel the hain elef, even if you have a thousand, the amount is the amount of bread you need for one stand or two standard meals, which is shem shemoyna esrei grogorois. It's 24 dried figs. Uh, we're going to mention an opinion in a minute that's going to say there's no opinion that, that it's that it's uh, a bit more 18. than that. There's 18, Robert. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, 18. My apologies. 18. Jehem Shkamoshe Shbeitzim, which is six eggs. Yes, Omen's opinion Shem Kamoshmoine Beitzim. There has to be eight. Right. Thank you for picking that up. So, we never need more than 18. So um, this is why when they put a, a box, you know, the large box of matzahs, that is sufficient, even though there's thousands of people in the city. So that's how much we need. Now, um, next condition. Now, as we said, everyone in theory well, in practice also, but they have to have the rights to eat from it. And that makes them a resident of the house where the food is kept because that's where my food is. I, I eat there, or at least I could eat there. You know, any Shabbos, you know, I eat in my house, but there could be a Shabbos. I'm invited out for every Shabbos meal. So I didn't eat a meal in my house. It's still my house because that's where my food is and where I sleep. So... Um, even if I don't eat there, the fact that I could eat there makes me a resident. Okay, so number nine. Now, you have to, it has to be that the people can come eat the food. Right? I can't be someone who says, you know, you know if I take, let's say, for example, I take the food. I take my halas that I'm planning to eat for Shabbos. And I, I'm Mr. A. And I say to Mr. B, acquire this for someone else, for the, every, all the other residents. And he picks it up and he acquires it. But in reality, I'm planning to eat that on my Shabbos meal. And I'm going to be very upset if someone comes and eats it and steals my Shabbos food. Right? You can't do that. Like, you can't have the attitude. They have to, everyone has to have the ability to come Take the food. The imakbid alav, and if a person doesn't let other people take it, they they it's mine. Then ain't an It's not an eruv. He did not make the eruv in that case, even though they did all the actions. He said the blessing. He's put the food in the place. 
But if other people don't have the right to take it when they want to, the Erev was not made. Therefore, you have to make sure you don't make the air of something that you prepared for yourself for Shabbos. No, it can't be made with my, uh, my kugel. That's it. So it's, uh, Hashem, we, we always make enough kugel for everyone. That's uh, how it goes. All right. Number 10, Yud. So the Erev has to be placed somewhere where everyone has access, well, in a place, where they can go, I'm going to find this in a minute. So, two things here. means the twilight period between sunset and nightfall. So between the sun dropping below the horizon and the time that three stars come out. So the Erev has to exist for that time from the beginning of from actual sunset until after nightfall. And during that time, people have to have access. So if I keep the Erev in my house, let's say I've got the, um, the, the matzah in my house. Now, I don't have to give access to people at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Just because it's kept in my house and uh, everyone has, the, has an ownership in it and they're allowed to eat it, it doesn't mean I have to leave my front door open and anyone can walk around my house at any time, you know. But they do have to be able to have access in this twilight period. From the till just before twilight until just after, well, from the second of twilight till just after nightfall. So they do have to have, it has to be a place where they can where they can get it. So if it's all locked up, um, it doesn't help. Um, therefore, let's say there was a person or in the adjacent apartment, there was a deceased person, God forbid. Someone passed away. Shem should protect us from this. And one of the residents. Of this courtyard is a kohen, and we know a kohen cannot become tommy, can't have interaction with a deceased unless it's uh, the only exception of certain close relatives. So, except for very, certain very close relatives, a kohen can't go to a funeral, they, they can't go to a hospital that has a morgue, various things. They get they're stuck. And so, this kohen can't enter this building because there's a corpse in the building. Someone just passed away uh, or whatever it is. There's a hospital, the morgue is part of this building, you know, whatever happens to be. Bottle the Erev. The Erev is not good because someone does not have access. So not only not having access means it's not locked up and, and uh, you know, uh, commandos on the front door keeping everyone out. Um, but also, even if religiously, there's not, you can't have access. So uh, in theory, there's no physical barrier stopping him from just walking in and taking it. But halakhically, he can't go into this um, building or room because there's a, a deceased there and he's a coin. You know, today... Um, it's not so common to have a deceased at home. I mean, not that it was necessarily that common in those days, but, uh, you know, they didn't have professional funeral parlors and, and various things. You know, the Chabra Kedisha would was, in most towns, was a, a voluntary uh, burial society, and they came to the person's house, and they, they uh, prepared the deceased for burial uh, in the house. Um, so what happened? And if it was right before Shabbos, uh, they really couldn't do anything until after Shabbos. So it stayed there. Okay. So uh, any questions on that? No? Okay. 
Number 11. Now, Yesh Shabbos. In concept, this Eru should be made every week. Of a Shabbos, Yibsa Allah. And um, on Shabbos, you should make a moti on that bread. In other words, it should, it should get eaten each week. That's in concept. Ach, however, im yesh lachlush pen yishkach pam achas. If you're worried, if we have to do this every week, and you're worried this what's going to happen, is someone's going to forget one week, or more than one week. You know, we know especially in winter, you have this mad rush Friday afternoon, and uh, all of a sudden, whoops, it's an hour to Shabbos, no one made the Eiruf. So if you're going to be worried about that situation, yachol la'ara b'kika echad l'chol shabbos l'shala pesa. You can make an Eiruv on one loaf until Pesach. So it'll last until Pesach. Um, obviously, it has to be a loaf that's going to stay fresh till Pesach. Because if it rots, it doesn't exist anymore. It's the same food as eaten. So that's why they use matzah. The Eimer Badein Eiruv of Achulu is same. And when he says, uh, by the means of this Eiruv, you conclude. So, so in the statement we said before, with this Eiruv, you can carry and you can take from, from the house to the courtyard, and the courtyard to the house, and house to house, house, you add to the end of that statement, the whole Hashabosis out of Pesach Every single week until Pesach comes upon us for good, for goodness. The Sarshyase Akika Dak Bafaitivishli is kalkal. It has to be a thin loaf and well baked so it doesn't become spoiled. So it doesn't have to be matzah, it can be melba toast, you know, things like that. Something that's really baked well, but it doesn't spoil. The Shabbos Shabbasha Pesach, and on the Shabbos within in Pesach itself, Yasa Eruv Matzah Kashera, you make the Eruv with kosher matzah. And that's what we and as has been pointed out already, nowadays we normally do that, the, the Shabbos, we do that right before Pesach, and it goes to the next Pesach. Okay. Number uh, 12. Now, you don't make this Erev on Yontif. Now, we're going back to a situation where they make it week by week. So although we need to make it on Shabbos every week, we do not need to make it on Yontav. Because on, on Yontav, you're anyway allowed to uh, carry. But the issue is we're concerned. What we, well, it doesn't mean that for you. What I'm saying making it for Yontav, what we mean is, let's say Yontav was a Friday. So I normally make it every week. And I make it every Friday. But... This Friday is Yontav. If I make the Erev on a Friday, it looks like I'm preparing on Yontav for after Yontav, which is disrespectful to the Yontav. So therefore, Vim Chal Yontav Erev Shabbos, if a Yontav falls out on a Friday, I have to make the Erev, I have to make the Erev on Thursday. Or if Yontav is Thursday, Friday, I have to make it on Wednesday, right? So we we uh, we don't make the Erev on a Yontav for Shabbos. Okay. Number 13. Someone who eats in one place and sleeps in another place, right? So uh, he's got you know, um, a nursing home or a shiva dormitory might be uh, an example of this. Um, so which one is his residence for Shabbos? We're saying mokem achilosoi who are ikele inyanze. The place of his eating, where he eats, is the primary Shabbos residence. The shamu oise im oichel sham shloi bechei miyachad. Right? And it's there that he prohibits 
the other tenants, the other people live in the courtyard from carrying, if they weren't included in the Eruv, if he eats in his, his, his own food there. Okay, so let, let's, but the place where he sleeps, he doesn't prohibit anyone else. So let's give an example. So um, all of us here live in one courtyard, one apartment building. And uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm in one of the squares. So in my little square, that's where I sleep. My apartment is where I sleep. But I don't eat there. I eat at um, my, my I eat at my in-laws always. I don't have any kitchen in my house. Um, it hasn't been installed yet, or I don't want one, or even there is a kitchen. I don't use it. Right. I only sleep in this apartment. I don't eat there. Don't eat my meals there. So what happens is that even if I don't join your Arif, everyone else. I didn't ruin the Eruv because this, even though I sleep there, it's not my primary Shabbos residence. My primary Shabbos residence is where I eat. So if the other place where I eat, if I don't join the Eruv, then I can mess up the Eruv for other people. I don't want to be part of it. Now, most of the time, we eat and sleep in the same place. So it's sort of irrelevant. But it happens to be that a person sleeps in one place and eats in another place where they sleep is not their primary residence so they don't have to be part of the don't have to join in the Arif but where they eat is a primary residence there they do have to join in okay you're Dawid so now we're going to speak about not where I live but I come to visit so um, I, uh, what country again, Robert? You, you went to another country. I live in Panama, in Panama. Panama. So yeah. I go visit Panama and Robert generously hosts me. Absolutely. Thank you. So, I'm in, so even though it's not really my residence, but for this Shabbos, I'm in Panama. That's where I'm staying. So now what? Do I have to be part of the Eruv or not? So that's what we're going to discuss now in uh, in fourteen. So Hamis Arach Bechotzen, I'm a guest in a courtyard or an apartment building or a place wherever it is, um, and it doesn't have to be another country, but it's not where I normally live. Yesh Oyemim, there is an opinion. So we're going to see that we can be lenient on certain occasions. But ideally, we want to try and get everything perfect. There is an opinion that fill on this araf babayis mechnei atzmo. That even if there's a guest, if he stays in the home by himself, im loy nisarach derech kavua. As long as he doesn't live there permanently, el shloi shim yom apotes mezeh, thirty days or less. So we say 30 days, once someone lives in a place 30 days, it gives him a certain sort of uh, permanence. That's why if you rent a home outside of Israel, anywhere except Israel, if you rent a home, you don't have to put up mezuzahs or you don't get the mitzvah. There's the mitzvah to put up a mezuzah doesn't begin until 30 days. So even if you put them up beforehand, you have to take what, at least one down and, and say a bracha and put it up. Because you're not a permanent resident, you're not actually a resident to you being there 30 days. But since I mentioned it, if you buy the house, then you have to put the mezuzah up as soon as you move in or you start storing your things there. Because the fact that you own it makes you a resident. Okay, in Israel, it's different. Even if you rent, you have to have mezuzahs from the first day because uh, we, we are the natural residents we're, we're the indigenous people of, uh, of Eretz Israel, of, of land of Israel. But outside of Israel, if you're renting, even though you, you signed a, a 50 year lease, until you're there 30 days, you're not a resident yet. So this guest, he's staying there, even if he's not a guest in someone's house, if he's living, he's got the house himself, even. If he's there 30 days or less, 
he doesn't ruin the hearts of anyone else. The kulmatur mepalto, and everyone can carry the balabotim, the base of oirech. They people don't only carry from their own houses to call yah backwards. They can even carry to my house, and I'm not part of the eruv backwards and forwards. Bein mebate balabotim, bein base of oirech. Said that the fill in a orichim rabim balabais echod. Even if there's ten houses, nine of them are guests, and one of them lives there, still not a problem. They don't require an aid of him in that case. Now this is bedavka bedika balabais kavua. Now this is only true if there's at least one permanent resident. But fillu hugoi, even if that resident is not Jewish, so uh, in a hotel. Now some hotels do have permanent residents. You know people who find it's easier to uh, live in a hotel or they live there extended times. But if it's a type of hotel where no one stays more than 30 days, then as the Orichim Betel and the Gabe, if there's at least one permanent resident, so let's say the hotel manager lives in the hotel and you've got a thousand rooms or apartments or townhouses, but none of these people stay more than 30 days, they all become nullified to him and we don't need the aid of in this hotel. I will im kulam heim orchim, but if everyone in the hotel or wherever happens to be are guests, there's no permanent resident, then they all, they all forbid each other to carry unless there's one room designated for eating, then they become like residents. So let's say like a, like a camp or something. Or again, like Yeshiva dormitory, there's one, there's one um, no one who lives there is that, well, they might eventually become permanent residents because they're there look, more than 30 days. But until 30 days, there's no permanent resident there, but they all eat in the one dining room. So therefore, they become like one household, even without making a room. So um, many hotels today, you know, there's not someone who lives on site. Most of uh, the bigger hotels. Some of the smaller motels, you know, you have the person who, who owns it or runs it, the manager sometimes lives there. But in a, you know, if you went to a, I don't know, Hilton or something, there's no, <laughs> it's generally speaking, not a permanent resident. So, um, a person can't carry in the common area unless they make an area with all the uh, other thousand uh, people in the um, in the hotel. Okay. Now, Now, if there is a non-Jew amongst the people who want to make this area, to the common, they have to rent his residence from him, as we're going to explain later, the how and why and exactly to what extent and different things. So we're going to get there. Now, that's one opinion. So one opinion said, till 30 days, the guy doesn't count. There's another view, that a guest, a temporary resident, is no different to a permanent resident. The Any person that has their own room to eat, so in a hotel, or a guest house, or whatever happens to be, if there's not a shared kitchen, they have they eat the meals in their own quarters. Dine Kabbalah Bais, he has the exact same halachic uh, requirements as a permanent resident. Therefore, he says, we should be strict. In the first instance, we should be strict. We should, so we're in the situation, we should make an Eiruv. But you make this Eiruv without a bracha, because according to one opinion, you don't need it, and we don't want to say a bracha for nothing. However, with the Eved, after the fact, uh, you didn't make the Eiruv, and you want to carry, we are able to rely on the first opinion and carry, even though we didn't make an Eiruv, if there's not, you know, this... This person, this guest, didn't join in. Okay. 
to run a time. Any any questions on that? No. Is it too technical or it's uh, is explaining clear enough? It's clear, but the time is up. Okay. Rabbi, what about uh, like a practical application if a person goes to a hotel and there's a hundred rooms, then what do you do? So it shouldn't really carry um, that's all. We should, we should be strict. But if there was a, a pressing need, so let's say for an example, um, you got a little baby and uh, you, you were in the lobby and Shabbos started. Now you're stuck. So you don't have to sit in the lobby the whole Shabbos. You, know, you, could, you could carry the baby. But in the first instance, um, you, know, you, you wouldn't carry outside. Yeah, Susan, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. How did they? How did they make? It? Sorry. How did, they make a, how, how did they say that where you eat is your primary residence, not where you sleep? Where? How? How did they come up with that? Where you? Um, eat, that's so to me. It's peculiar because if if I always eat in restaurants, I never eat in my house. Yes, we don't mean a restaurant. We mean a regular place. Um, so when we set up the Eiruf, the whole concept of the Eiruf is that, so let's say the loaf of bread is in my house and all of you have a share in loaf of bread. You become residents in my house because you, you eat or at least have the right to eat this food in my house. So the concept of the Eiruf puts the eating as the primary place. Because it's all about having a shared kitchen, making us residents in the in the one one thing. So it, it doesn't mean in general. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't mean in general, you know, where you sleep doesn't count. But for this specific halacha, we look at at where your food is. Okay. All right. So we'll see everyone tomorrow morning. God willing. See you in the morning. Thank you. God very much. willing. Bye. -bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, drive safely, Yitzchak. Bye bye. Thank you.